I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law class about the case National Credit Union Administration versus First National Bank and Trust. This is a United States Supreme Court case from 1998 about the doctrine of standing, who has standing to sue, and the zone of interest test. Now, quick recap for my students or review. The basic doctrine of standing to sue that you may have learned in your first year constitutional law class is pretty straightforward. There's three prongs, injury in fact, uh, causation, and judicial redressability. In practice, the cases get a lot messier than that. And um, when we uh, talk about administrative law cases where someone is uh, uh, often an association, like a trade association or a special interest group, is trying to challenge a decision from a regulatory agency. Well, now we're not just talking about a traditional, let's say, a lawsuit between a plaintiff and a defendant over uh, a, uh, an injury or a breach of contract, but we're talking about uh, trying to undo what a, a government agency has done. And one of the doctrines the Supreme Court has crafted uh, to deal with these cases is called the zone of interest test. And this is one of the big cases in that um, line of decision. So let's look at what happens in this case. It's a little bit technical and it's related to banking law. So bear with me. Our main takeaway here, this is a five to four decision. A lot of our cases about standing um, historically are close uh, cases, uh, five, four, um, that the banks and the American Bankers Association did have standing to challenge an interpretation by the National Credit Union Administration of the Federal Credit Union Act. Um, by the way, this case splits on uh, sort of party lines almost of conservatives and uh, versus liberals on the court at the time, but uh, not the way other, some of the other standing cases do. Um, here, the uh, conservatives are in the majority, the conservatives on the court, uh, basically siding with the banks, the big banks, and saying that they have standing. And the decision that's being challenged was one by the uh, administration approving a federal credit union that was composed of multiple unrelated employer groups, each having its own common bond or op uh, occupation. And um, so what this did was it kind of loosened the standards or uh, for federal getting a charter as a federal credit union or getting approved to operate as one. And before this, that you would have had to have a, a more closely related um, group having a credit union. And uh, just for my students to understand, if you're not familiar with credit unions, think of it as a type of like banking co-op with uh, people who are all employers of the same company or municipality, or maybe are tradesmen in an area like the mechanics or something like that. Or it could be sort of a neighborhood banking co-op. And they get special um, uh, deals for their members and so forth. So in, in some ways, they're very competitive with going to a tr traditional bank, but only the people that are in that defined group can bank at the credit union. Not to, not just anyone. And so what this did was this case ends up kind of um, the, the decision by the administration opened up the door to more credit unions or credit unions that can uh, reach a broader class of customers, which means they're going to start in, encroaching on the customer base of other regular banks. And so let's look at what happened and why the court does what it does. And we have to start with the statute, which of the Federal Credit Union Act. Um, and Section 109 provides that federal credit union membership shall be limited to groups having a common bond of occupation or association. So for example, all of the municipal employees for, or county employees could have a credit union uh, that they can use, or to groups within a well-defined neighborhood community or rural district. And what happened was the National Credit Union Administration had approved some charter amendments adding several unrelated employer groups to the membership of AT&T Family Federal Credit Union. Now, let's go to the holding here. The Supreme Court's majority in this case found that the banks, and here we're talking about regular banks like um, uh, Bank of America or Citibank, um, that they fell within the zone of interest protected by the statute. 
Um, and in other words, they said that the zone of interest uh, that what Congress was trying to do was to limit competition in banking services, or at least to kind of level the playing field. So it, 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 because credit unions don't have quite the same restrictions and um, regulatory burdens that other banks do. So if we have more credit unions, the, from the bank's perspective, they have an unfair advantage in the market. And so the statute was originally supposed to kind of limit um, the, the credit unions. And the majority here says that that served a policy goal of protecting other banks from unfair competition. And what the majority held was that there was an unmistakable link between the statute's regulation of federal credit union membership and its limitation on the markets that credit unions can serve. In other words, if you're going to um, limit a credit union and say you can only have customers who work for a certain employer or live in a certain um, uh, geographic community or, or area, then that's going to limit how many credit unions there are. And so the other banks only have to compete with each other most of the time, with other banks that have to follow all the same rules. I pull out a quote uh, from the majority opinion for those of you who like to highlight in your casebook that sort of goes to the heart of the court's reasoning here. Quote, the proper inquiry is simply whether the interest sought to be protected by the complainant is arguably within the zone of interest um, to be protected by the statute. And I want you to really look at that and see what's happening here. We're, in some ways, we're sort of stretching the zone of interest test and giving the benefit of the doubt to plaintiffs and saying, as long as you're arguably within the zone of interest, you don't have to prove that you absolutely are up front. But if you arguably are, then we're going to give you standing to sue. They continue, and the majority opinion continues, thus, even if it cannot be said that Congress had the specific purpose of benefiting commercial banks, one of the interests arguably to be protected is limiting the markets that federal credit unions can serve. And, and, and therefore, it's arguable that that implies kind of protecting the regular banking industry from unfair competition by credit unions. Now, we have a dissenting opinion from Justice O'Connor, and I want you to notice the breakdown on the court here, who sides with her. Justice O'Connor was appointed, was a Republican appointee to the court, but she was the swing voter on the court when she, while she was on it. And she's joined here by sort of the left wing of the court at the time, Justice Stevens, Souter, and Breyer. And they argued that the plaintiffs did not get past the zone of interest hurdle. In other words, they didn't really satisfy the zone of interest test. And the, the majority had conflated the fact that there was a causal relationship with the FEC's decision and the injury um, with uh, evidence of Congress's intent in the statute. In other words, uh, they acknowledged that there, the zone of interest test is the right test to apply. And they acknowledged that the FEC's decision was kind of bad news for the banks. But the fact that an agency makes a decision that's bad news for the plaintiffs in a case, they're saying, does not automatically put you within the zone of interest. And let's look, I pulled out a quote that helps explain why. Quote, competitive injury to respondents' commercial interests does not arguably fall within the zone of interest sought to be protected by the common bond provision in the statute. The common bond requirement is concerned primarily with defining membership in a way that secures a financially sound organization. And so this is really useful for students in understanding the zone of interest test. When you have a case like this, you have to look at what was Congress really trying to do with the statute? And the dissenters in this case, uh, um, following uh, Justice O'Connor, think that the Congress was trying to do something very different with the statute than what the majority thinks. And that's going to affect what the zone is that's per, uh, of who falls within the zone of interest. In other words, uh, to kind of clarify, we if you have a zone of interest case, you have to go back to the statute in uh, the underlying statute, a relevant statute. And then you need to um, look at what was the purpose, the policy goal of this statute or this particular provision within the statute. And then we look from there, we say, okay, whoever's interest we were tr Congress was trying to protect, that's the zone of interest and the plaintiff has to fall within that zone. And the problem here is that sometimes readers, people even including Supreme Court justices, 
look at a provision in the statute and think that it the goal was to do different things. And the dissenters here think that the goal of the credit union statute was to protect investors from insolvent banks, uh, from an insolvent credit union, sorry, that, um, that basically they didn't want the customers of the credit unions to lose their savings and lose their investment when the credit union failed. And so Justice O'Connor says she thinks that the interest to be protected was the financial solvency of the credit unions with the goal of protecting the customers of the credit unions. The majority thinks that the goal was to basically limit how many um, the the operation of credit unions because they get some regulatory benefits that other banks don't have or an easier path um, along those lines, and therefore they they think it's implied that Congress was trying to protect other banks from unfair competition by credit unions because it would limit how many credit unions there are and where they are and who can be customers of those credit unions. And because they see what's go what Congress is trying to do kind of in the abstract differently when they look at that statute, they're gonna define a different zone of interest being protected, and that's gonna re uh, yield the different outcomes or conclusions about which plaintiffs fall within that zone. So the statute really matters for zone of interest cases. And that concludes our lecture about the National Credit Union Administration case.